warm welcome to today's webinar organized by the Norwegian Business Association in Singapore. We have today 60 minutes to discuss the current geopolitical turmoil and its uh, impact on Singapore and the Southeast East Asia region. We have a level of complexity that we would not be able to cover in a good way without today's excellent panel. The chat line is open and we welcome questions from the uh, participants. We have with us four uh, excellent uh, participants and it's James Crabtree is Associate Professor at Lee Kuan Yew School. Dr. Deborah Elms, Ex Executive Director at Asia Trade Center. Chesty Strudman, Foreign News Journalist at the Norwegian Broadcasting Corporation. And last but not least, Manu Baskaran, CEO of Singapore Centennial Asia Advisories. So we want this discussion to be as interactive as possible. And I want to open up uh, James uh, Crabtree, if I could ask you to give us a big picture considering the forces within macro and uh, micro economics unfolding globally, impacting Asia in a big way and Singapore in particularly. TikTok has been on the negotiating table, um, but what are the deeper ramifications setting the scene for the long-term tech war between US and uh, China, James. Thanks, Leo. Well, let me just give the biggest picture overview I can for a minute or two. I mean, it seems to me that we're, we're pretty close to uncharted territory in this part of the world. The, the easiest way to view that is through the lens of the relationship between the US and China, which is clearly as bad as it's been for decades. I think the thing that um, we need to keep an eye on is that it could get considerably worse. Um, that, that in some ways, um, particularly on the Chinese side, there's been a reasonable amount of restraint over the last couple of years in the relationship with the US. And um, I'm sure we'll go on to talk about the US election, but if Mr. Trump is re-elected, I think there's a, a good deal of what the analysts would call downside risk. But I suppose what interests me is that there's a broader fracturing of the, the regional order. So you've seen in the aftermath of COVID, that the international institutions that are meant to cope with crises are not working very well. The G20 in particular has done very little um, in the aftermath of the pandemic. Um, you see other divisions opening up um, between the important blocks around the world. So the most obvious one here is between India and China. Um, in the aftermath of COVID, the, the hardening of the divide between India and China, the move of India decisively into a kind of anti-Chinese camp, um, for the first time in, in a long time. It's probably the most significant geopolitical consequence um, of the last six months and one with long lasting implications for, for this region. But you also see that in other respects, for instance, between China and the European Union, where you've seen a hardening of opinion in Germany in particular um, uh, between the EU and China and to some degree a, a move away from the EU's traditional engagement and trade approach to China and a more security focused engagement. Equally multilaterally, you know, this is a moment where ASEAN has become more divided and weaker in the aftermath of the pandemic. And if you're looking at Asia, look at something like the free and open Indo-Pacific, it's not very clear where this framework is going to be pushed from now that Shinzo Abe is no longer the Prime Minister of Japan, given he was the figure who was sort of doing a lot of the heavy lifting in that regard. I'm sure we can talk more about the economic situation. It strikes me that also could get worse. And technologically, the same is true. And um, decoupling, we've talked a lot about, but it hasn't really begun to happen yet, but lots of people are preparing for that. And, and that's something that I'm sure we could get into. TikTok is a good example of how far we've come in a very short time. What, what happened with TikTok, the fact that it was effectively forced nationalized, or that's what the Americans were trying to do, or to, to, to shut it down is a huge change in policy direction from what used to be the, the guarantor of an open liberal trading order to now one which is much more nationalistic and protectionist. So I think that's my, my bottom line is, you know, things are bad, but they could get quite a lot worse. So we're in for a bumpy ride. Thank you, James. Not a very encouraging uh, opening statement, but uh, truth is important in this uh, setting. Manu Baskaran, Asia and Singapore is sandwiched between two superpowers and have to balance the art of uh, pleasing both of them. But has the time come for Singapore and the countries around Asia to take more headstrong choices, enabling that the region protects itself and becomes stronger together? What's your take on that, Manu? Thank you, uh, Leo. Uh, and that's a uh, very pertinent question. 
Uh, looking at it first from the perspective of uh, Singapore, <clears throat> and I don't speak for Singapore, but it's just my view. Uh, first of all, <clears throat> we can never put ourselves in a position where we have to choose between the US or China. Uh, both uh, are needed uh, politically, <clears throat> economically, security wise. So we can't make a choice uh, and we have to make it clear, we have to signal very clearly uh, to the big powers that <clears throat> we should not be pressed to make a choice. And that is a big consideration for, for a country like Singapore. Um, we have to also take uh, notice of the fact that uh, the tensions between the two big powers are probably going to intensify in the areas that matter a lot to us, which is first of all, uh, trade and technology. Uh, a bifurcated world is not a good world for a global hub like Singapore, which depends on flows of goods and services and ideas and capital and so on. <laughs> Secondly, <clears throat> the main arena for US-China contention is likely to be uh, East Asia, particularly the South China Sea and the East China Sea. And that's in our immediate environment and affects countries that we have very close political, economic and security ties with. So the dangers are very, very clear to us. So we have to protect ourselves. And the best way we can do is to find strength in numbers. Um, one framework we can turn to is, of course, the ASEAN framework. But unfortunately, ASEAN is not as co cohesive, as organized, as uh, strongly led as it was before. So the reality is that uh, ASEAN will help, but only up to a very limited point. So we then have to really go back to bilateral relationships and create this whole web and network of different alliances, different economic partnerships that can help us, uh, help to protect us against the economic as well as the political security ramifications of uh, these growing tensions. Let me stop there. Thank you, Manu. So, uh, Dr. Deborah Elms, the one suffering the most in the current trade war is possibly American firms operating in China. As example, the semiconductor industries, Starbucks, 5,000 outlets, etc., etc. How do you think this will develop and where are the opportunities for companies in Singapore given the industry disruption we now see? Thanks. Uh, it's a great question. And I think one of the things that I find a bit refreshing about my two colleagues already is mentioning the importance of thinking about this as a long term problem, because one of the issues that we found when we deal with companies, especially, is that many of them seem to be too short sighted about how long they will be in this situation. Many firms seem to imagine that somehow we snap back to normal, whatever that is, in the relatively near future especially after US election takes place and hopefully we have a change in gov government on the US side, somehow 2021 and beyond will be fantastic and this will all just be a sad, sad lockdown memory that we're, that we're living through right now. Uh, and I think what's important to remember is that these, these trends were already in place, although of course we're in a slightly different place as a result of both the personalities involved, US, China especially, but also, of course, COVID, which has poured fuel on whatever fires, whatever, whatever obstacles, challenges you had beforehand. So that has accelerated a lot of existing trends. And for companies trying to navigate this environment, it's gotten ex exceptionally challenging because not only are you dealing with a fundamentally disrupted trade landscape, supply and demand remains changed, even in places like China that have largely returned to normal, demand remains a bit of an issue, especially in, in, in previous markets. And so you're dealing with disruptions in supply, disruptions in demand, future changes in markets that you may not have experienced before, compounded with the tensions that come from COVID, lockdowns, government protectionist policies in lots of different markets. And on top of all of that, then we have this US-China trade tension in a fragmented global landscape, which is not likely to be easily resolved. So I think for firms, the, the, the first piece of advice is to pay attention to the fact that this doesn't just go away and you need to actually deal with it long term. And I would say it's not just American firms in China who are struggling with this challenge. It's firms almost everywhere to a, a greater or lesser degree who have to navigate some really difficult waters in the coming I don't know how long it will be. I don't have that kind of crystal ball, but let's say in the next couple of years at least to develop some kind of, of path for the future. And I think that is why 
this is a really, I mean, it's an interesting time to live through. I wish I were not endlessly sitting in my dining room to experience it, but it's very fascinating to, to watch as firms and governments try to grapple with this entirely different landscape and figure out what is going to be a new normal whenever that arrives. Thank you, Deborah. Shasti Strömmen, with your extensive experience covering Asia as a journalist, not just by living in Asia, but also by keeping an eye on the development from a European perspective, you have had close encounters with realities in Asia, latest by being on the ground in Hong Kong, and uh, today you are joining us from, from within China. What is your biggest concern and biggest hope for Asia in the midst of this uh, trade war? Yeah, there's like now this big dividend between China and US that seems to just be growing. And uh, with the China's position and this with the growing economy and also growing politically, uh, that they are actually less and less interested in taking criticism or input from the outside world, which is why we've seen these uh, so-called so wolf warriors defending China in very strong words whenever anyone criticizes China. It seems like now there's like uh, development where people, countries, uh, businesses uh, in larger extents will have to take a position either for China and against the US or the opposite way. Uh, it's very difficult now to be uh, friend with both parties. And we've seen also that China is um, struggling a bit with the aftermath of these wolf warriors, uh, that Europe is now uh, becoming very skeptical to China. And we have seen the foreign minister and also Xi Jinping now trying to calm Europe down because they're afraid that they will actually lose their position in the Western world with the US being so um, critical now to China and also Australia and uh, some other countries might be following. So when we look at the Southeast Asia, this will be the really big challenge, how to actually cope with these two uh, enormous economies and political powers that they're both dependent on. Because uh, um, like China has said before, that most Southeast uh, countries seem to be interested in dealing with China when it comes to trade, but politically or for defense goes to the US. And uh, China will, to a lesser extent, actually accept this in the future. Thank you, Shasti. So let's move over to the uh, debate directly head on. And is the current empty China policies in US actually driven by Donald Trump or powered from within US deep state, Pentagon and think tanks in Washington, DC? Is the anti-China sentiment in the U.S. in principle pushed forward independently of who is the president in the U.S.? Who want to try that one? If I can I'll, ask maybe James. I'll, I'll, have, I'll have a go quickly. I mean, I suppose I, I, I don't particularly like this language about the deep state and deep state conspiracy theories. Um, I mean, I think there's been a just a broad rethinking of the role um, of the bilateral relationship between the US and China on all sides. Um, and so those who were hawkish of China have become even more hawkish and those who were more moderate um, have become more hawkish. Everybody's become a bit more hawkish. I think you can overdo this um, uh, issue though, because although that there, there's now a consensus, which we're all very familiar with now, the, the rejection of the consensus that if China is engaged with and liberalizes its economy, it will become more liberal and democratic. And so now the consensus is that that isn't going to happen. But there's no consensus about what to do about China. Um, you know, there's all, if, you, if you were to go into the US House, um, House of Representatives or Senate, you know, you'd find a hundred different ideas about what the right policy approach is. So there's still a lot of diversity within the United States about what the right course of action is on something like industrial policy or what do you do with Chinese technology companies or what sort of things should companies be allowed to sell into China and that sort of thing. So there's still a, a lot of room for debate, even if this this broad intellectual consensus about the direction of the Chinese regime um, uh, has hardened. Thank you. Maybe I'll come in uh, here. Um, yeah. I think it's a question of trust, right? I mean, it's not just uh, particular individuals or particular components of uh, the state deep or otherwise. Um, and essentially what has happened is that trust has been broken. Uh, the Americans would say that uh, 
Mr. Xi Jinping came to the Rose Garden of the White House and stood there with President Obama and said that he would not militarize the South China Sea Isles that um, his uh, military had taken over. And uh, as he was speaking, they were actually militarizing it. And the Americans say that uh, it shows that you can't trust this leadership. Once trust is broken, then it's very difficult to prevent this action, reaction, countermeasures that puts the relationship into a downward spiral. So I, I think it goes beyond just Mr. Trump and particular individuals. Secondly, I think the <clears throat> what Mr. Trump has done is to uh, empower those who are determined to be um, hawks on China, and they have entrenched policies, regulations, uh, strategies in the American system that will outlast Mr. Trump, and which uh, any future president I think would find difficult to reverse. So I, I think we are in for a long period of uh, tense relations uh, between the two countries. Um, I don't think there'll be any major clash, but um, certainly we'll just have to get used to a lot of heat and uh, episodes of stress. Just if you have now been on the ground in China since uh, March this year, and you have obviously seen the sentiments on the ground in, in China, what is your take on this uh, question in particularly? Uh, how does the Chinese really see where this anti-sentiment against China is coming from? Is it Trump-driven or is it more from the American system? I think they're now trying to actually, when it comes to, for example, the late, uh, the late um, uh, development with TikTok, uh, trying to extend uh, the development by actually um, coming up with new laws saying that you cannot export uh, Chinese technology without the blessing of uh, the uh, state. This is one way to kind of wait and see what happens with the Chinese, uh, with the US election. But I think there's also an understanding here in uh, China that this might not uh, actually pass with Trump if he loses the election and might actually continue for a long time because it's almost now as if the world is awakening a bit when it comes also to this um, uh, digital challenge with uh, we have because now it seems like we're developing a world uh, you know that will be pro china technology or pro the western technology and it will be really difficult to see how we can actually mix these two as long as there's this western uh, um, angst would i say when it comes to uh, the chinese government's position in these chinese companies uh, and their technology if they can actually be used to survey other countries. So I think that um, Chinese are also becoming more nationalistic, more strong-minded when it comes to how China should actually stand up against the US. And uh, we don't really know where this, is, this will, will end, but we, it'll be really interesting to see the uh, political uh, development in the US with the president election. If there will be any you know, better ways to mend this relationship if Biden wins. In the past uh, few weeks, we have learned that many China tech giants are locating their South Asia headquarters to Singapore. Is uh, Singapore actually then set to benefit strategically and location-wise due to the ongoing U.S.-China trade war? Also here having in mind the, the Hong Kong uh, situation. De Deborah, what do you think on that? Yes and no. So on the one hand, there is a certain amount of opportunity, of course. Anytime that you have disruption, you know, people are looking for what are often called sort of safe havens. Singapore often comes to the top of that list. It's relatively stable, although we're all still stuck at home. Our caseloads for virus is fairly low. You have the ability to get out. You know, everyone is here in terms of businesses, different kinds of governments, et cetera. So there's a lot of attractive things about Singapore as a destination, which is why we have so many multinationals, including so many Norwegian companies who are located or headquarters located here in Singapore. So on the one hand, that's fantastic. On the other hand, the more that you have tension between China and the US, the more challenging it is for Singapore as a country to navigate those difficulties because it can be, it can be difficult to be seen as neutral when you have an influx of investment. I mean, this week alone, we've had multiple comments about uh, inbound Chinese investment. Does that make Singapore too Chinese? Is it normally too American? So that, that achieving neutrality or at least something that doesn't appear to be tipping always to one side or the other is difficult. And I think for Singapore, 
They're going to have to think hard about their national interests. Where, where do they, then they're likely to align differently on different issues. That sounds fantastic, but the scope to do so might be limited. So I think it's, it's hard for Singapore. It will be challenging for some kinds of firms. Some firms will be fine. They'll be able to play off both sides. They'll be able to do sort of, you know, dual technology manufacturing as an example, where, you know, the left half of the factory is China des des destination. The right half is not China destinations. They'll be able to manage this, but for some kinds of technology and some kinds of firms, that will be very difficult, especially if we end up with deep technological uh, bifurcation on things like 5G. Because if you have a 5G that's on different platforms, different standards, it's very hard for companies to manufacture to two sets of standards inside the same location. And that makes it harder, I think, for Singapore to compete. It might have to pick one or the other because you can't sort of, you know, duct tape down the middle of the factory and say that's that's China. This is not China, in terms of our manufacturing capabilities, and that's that's hard to manage. James, I uh, think you I... have. Sorry, sorry, uh, Shafti, you, you go first. Yeah, I think it's um, we have to look at China in a very long historical perspective. The Chinese, they don't usually think in one, two, three, four, five years. They think in 100 years at the time. And I think a lot of the politics that we see from China at the moment is um, uh, we have to look at it in the perspective of centuries ago. I think what's uh, developing here is this enormous state which kind of looks at itself in the mirror of what it was like the time when all these states in Asia were kowtowing to China. So they were not like, it's not like they want to own these countries, but they want them to respect China and do what China wishes them to do. So I think for Singapore, this becomes really difficult, we will see in the future, because there's so many uh, Chinese speaking people in Singapore that China kind of expects Singapore to be pro-China. And Singapore has resisted this. But uh, I think, you know, I might not be around for it. But in the future, I think like uh, a lot of Asian countries will really uh, struggle with this Chinese perspectives, because they will not, uh, they will not actually accept this uh, allegiance to uh, the US in the long run, I think. It's uh, interesting what you say that China is thinking in hundreds and hundreds of years, whilst maybe the current president thinks in, in seconds. But uh, Manu, you were nodding, you wanted to add on something. Yeah, um, <clears throat> I just wanted to add on to um, what is said just now. I think we went through a patch between Singapore and China where there was this awkwardness. And I think what has happened now is that we have a new equilibrium in the relationship. I think China, perhaps because of Mr. Trump and the uh, uh, challenges it faces, has now become a bit more understanding of Singapore's position. And the relationship in the last year, year and a half has actually improved after a period of great difficulty where, you know, for, you may recall that um, China impounded some of our armored vehicles, which are on a ship from Taiwan to Hong Kong to Singapore. And uh, that is the nadir of the relationship. But since then, um, I think there's a better understanding between the two countries. Now, whether that lasts, I'm not sure. Uh, but it does highlight one important thing, which is that small countries do better if the large countries are contending against themselves. And for us to be in a position where we are still masters of our region, I'm talking about ASEAN, we need the US to balance China. No other country can. If the US becomes isolationist and withdraws or shows no interest in... Uh, <clears throat> permitting resources or whatever to the region, then China wins. And then we are in this very awkward position where we will um, be under a lot of pressure from China. But if China has to contend with other powers in the region, led by the US, uh, then there is more room for maneuver for the smaller countries, including Singapore. Uh, James, I believe you have been following the uh, TikTok saga quite uh, very closely. And you also mentioned initially that this is uh, something that's going to last for the long run. It's not over tomorrow, this, uh, this trade war. How, how bad, bad can it get? Yeah, I'm going to just concur with what Manu said, that for countries in Southeast Asia, this is the, the, the mantra of we don't want to choose is becoming much more complicated. Um, you know, Singapore has for a long time been the the first port of call for many Western companies wanting to invest in Asia and latterly for Chinese companies wanting to invest in Southeast Asia. And the more political those two relationships become, the more complicated it is to try and do both of those things at once. So even this week, 
you know, you'd think that the Singaporean elite would be delighted by the fact that you have first um, bite dance TikTok and then Tencent sort of setting up in Singapore. But actually, I mean, they are happy about that, but they're also very nervous about it because the more of this high profile Chinese money now comes in, then the more the Americans are going to start scrutinizing this and the more kind of complicated this will become. Um, so I think this is now a, a sort of feature and not a bug. Now, Singapore is very deft at managing these relationships, as Manu said, and so it's better set than most. Um, if the coronavirus, in a sense, is brought under control reasonably quickly and, and it can get out of this almost existential question of what is the role of a global hub in an era where nobody is traveling, um, if we can move beyond that, then I think you know Singapore has many advantages, but there's these geopolitical tensions mean that they have to be managed very, very carefully because it, it simply won't be possible to uh, to be both the, the, the favored friend of both corporate China and corporate America anymore. The outcome of the upcoming US election is highly uncertain, but is it Trump or Biden that in your opinion should be the preferred choice for Singapore and Asia? And why would oh, let me Let me have a go at that. So I, I, I mean, I guess we all have our own views. I think the more interesting question, the more interesting parlor game is who is the favored choice, uh, whether people are right about that. And I wrote a piece about that this week where I think more people than people in the West would realize favor Trump in this part of the world. Um, I mean, I think if you're a Norwegian, European, a liberal American, then the notion that anyone could like Trump is, is almost anathema. People have this blindness about him because he that he seemed to be such a, a kind of comprehensively bad thing. But actually, that's not how people view it in this part of the world. If you're in Japan, uh, certainly Taiwan, um, India, increasingly, you, know, you quite like Trump. He's, he, he might be chaotic and in some ways disorganized. You don't agree with him on everything, but he, he, he you know, punches China on the nose from time to time and, um, and, and has sort of things to recommend him. He also doesn't come and lecture you on human rights, doesn't talk about values, he's transactional, you can do business with him. And so I think there's quite a lot of nervousness about what Joe Biden would mean in this part of the world. Singapore is a more difficult case to read, and I think you, you can find strains of both um, types of thinking in places like Singapore and Australia, where, they, where people see the upsides of Trump's more rambunctious approach, but also the potentially more careful, more multilateral, allied-based approach of the Democrats. But the point I took away from, you know, the last time I went to Japan, which was before COVID, obviously, and I go to India a lot, you'd be surprised by how many people actually like Trump in this part of the world. Okay. Manu, what do you I think? Suppose, um, the question I have is, uh, you know, who would protect the things that are important <clears throat> to small countries like Singapore? It is important for us to have the international rule of law, to have institutions like the World Trade Organization and so on that work well because they protect us. And uh, the Trump administration, I think, has, um, has eroded that kind of uh, rule of law, of international law that we need. And if that's going to continue or worsen, then that's not good for this part of the world. Um, secondly, we need, uh, as I said earlier, <clears throat> a credible balance against China. Um, you know, we don't particularly like the US or we don't particularly like the Chinese. All big countries are bullies and we'd rather they not be around. But the fact is that they are around and the nearby bully is quite often more dangerous than the faraway bully. So we want the faraway bully to be here to balance China. And if under an isolationist administration, uh, you do not have a credible U.S. military presence uh, in this part of the world, a credible security presence, a credible economic presence, then that balance that helps protect us will not be there and we will suffer. So, you know, it, you know what kind of America do we want? We want an America that is engaged constructively and intelligently in the region, uh, you know, with the right kind of alliances, with the right kind of commitment to uh, international multilateral rules of uh, uh, engagement and so on. That's what we need. And I suspect that is more likely under Biden than under Trump. Thank you, Manu. De uh, Deborah, you have something? I would say in, in particular, one of the things that will matter about the, the sort of difference between these two gentlemen is not the individual and presidency, but also who they bring with them in their staff and in their rest of their agencies and organizations. So the assumption has been that if you have a Biden administration, it will be more thoughtful, more calculated, 
staffed with professionals who actually know things about Asia, know things about China, as opposed to the policy making that you have in Washington right now, which is completely chaotic, where decisions are literally made on the fly. So, you know, you're creating, as an example, an entities list of companies designed by individuals who know nothing really, except that they have a personal animosity potentially against some particular co company. And suddenly that becomes the entities list. And it's then, it's then handed over to the bureaucrats who are responsible for making the policy work rather than a thoughtful, careful, reasoned discussion about whether or not this or that organization may or may not be important to list and what are the consequences, ramifications, et cetera. So I think you expect that under a Biden team, even if the overall objective is somewhat similar between a Trump 2.0 and a Biden, that you actually have better people, more reasoned, thoughtful, careful people around him to help make those policies and then implement them than what you have currently. We, we promised uh, initially uh, into this webinar to dwell a little bit into Singapore's position in this uh, current setting. And Singapore is, as you know, been a natural choice for companies uh, from Norway and globally locating their Asia headquarters here. Do you see Singapore's position being strengthened or challenged during the years ahead? We already discussed it a little bit, but what will really improve Singapore's position if, if Singapore's authorities do the right things and what needs to be done looking long term? Can I uh, come in there? I, I think um, <clears throat> in a fundamental uh, sense, Singapore benefited from the strong tailwind of globalization, right? The increased flow of uh, goods, services, you know, capital, people, ideas, whatever. And if uh, we now go into a period not of deglobalization, but slow uh, globalization, uh, and particularly in trade, then obviously our role um, is weakened to some extent. So I think that's the fundamental challenge. Uh, can we go back to a period where we get a strong tailwind of growth in all these kinds of flows that a global hub uh, manages? I think that's the first thing. The second thing is that uh, although we have a lot going for us in terms of the cluster, the critical mass that we have got in place, uh, some of our competitive advantages have, I think, weakened to some extent. Costs, for instance, have uh, gone up and um, they are comp competing, uh, you know, regional centers that are trying to get our business, right? So for instance, in the last 15 years, we've seen the manufacturing components of business headquarters move out of Singapore to, uh, to Bangkok. And there could be more and more such uh, movements. So we've got to ensure that um, our costs are under control and our openness to talent, which is currently a big debate in Singapore, we don't get that wrong. Thank you. Shasti? Yeah, I think it'll be interesting to see what happens after the new security law in Hong Kong, because a lot of companies are now waiting to see what this actually what, what this law actually means. And we have been expecting a lot of companies to escape Hong Kong and maybe seek a uh, base in Singapore uh, if they can feel that this is a safer place to be also when it comes to, you know, the, the law system there. So uh, as far as it comes to now, it seems like a lot of people are just, a lot of companies are just waiting because they don't really know how it will end. But we might see a wave uh, uh, if the security law feels, um, uh, you know, that is threatening their position in Hong Kong. Uh, James, if you should name uh, one thing that Singapore really has to, to strengthen in the years to come, what would it uh, be in your mind? Manu's point about the openness to talent is a good one. I mean, all, all come, one of the when we think about globalization, we often think about money, uh, technology shooting around the world. But but people is one of the most problematic aspects of globalization. In all sorts of ways, people flows around the world have both organized people flows, um, as in managed migration of workers, but also unorganized people flows. If you think about the movement of people up through Africa and Syria into Europe and a forthcoming wave of climate refugees in Asia or Africa. You know, the movement of people is very problematic because it's ultimately people that causes dissatisfaction, you know, the change in an ethnic mix or the perception some people are winning and some people are losing. And so getting that balance right is very tricky, making sure that Singapore maintains its openness to, to talent and ideas 
especially at a time where there are forces pushing against that, not least the coronavirus, when, it, when actually being in one, one place in one country is becoming a little bit less important because of technology. So making sure that Singapore remains open to, to, to talent and, and have those effects of agglomeration while not undermining its own social compact and creating internal political dissent. I mean, I think that that's probably one of the most challenging things, but you know, Singapore has a lot going for it in a region that is not, um, you know, that, that, that doesn't have a uniform standard of governance. Singapore's public authorities work very well you know, they have fine institutions, um, you know, deep capital markets. There's a lot of advantages here. And given what's happening in Hong Kong, um, in a sense, there, there's plenty of kind of positive news the other way, I would say. So I remember when I moved to Singapore many years ago and going into a bookstore, you find book of the book about the Belt and Road Initiative in China. Uh, there's still some articles written about it and it's still on the agenda, but not as much as before. Will China's ambitions be hindered by the current anti-China sentiments in India and other countries on the way up to Europe. How do you think China strategically will manage this situation? Because the Belt and Road, as far as I understand it, is strategically and politically in China. It's very, very important to them. Chef Steve, maybe I could ask you uh, first, since you were on the ground in, in China, how is it seen from on the ground there? Yeah, it seems like uh, the Belt and Road Initiative is not as high on the agenda as it has been earlier. And I think uh, China finds it, you know, uh, important to kind of pay, play a bit low key at the moment because there's been a lot of criticism to the project. But I think we can see in South Asia, uh, a lot of different countries, Southeast Asia, trying to um, balance the China. They're afraid that China will take advantage uh, of the investments that they're giving these in these countries and the loans, they're afraid that they might not be able to pay back. And they're um, afraid that China will take, uh, you know, political advantage of projects that uh, they are not a those countries are not able to pay for, like uh, maybe when it comes to um, ports or railways and that kind of um, infrastructure that China also wants to build for its own purpose of when it comes to goods but also political influence. Oh, no, you seem to agree, but is there anything you want to add on to, to what Justin is mentioning? Uh, my sense is that the Chinese are recalibrating their approach to the Belt and Road uh, Initiative, and I think there's a, a review going on, and I suspect they'll come out with Belt and Road Initiative version 2 uh, <clears throat> sometime next year. And I suspect it will be much more selective, focused on its immediate periphery, Southeast Asia, Central Asia, uh, rather than India and Europe, and um, they would have, you know, reduce the amount of financial commitment that they would have to make, and they probably think that that would any uh, gain them more strategic advantages than spreading their resources all over, including Latin America and Africa. So I think we will have to wait and see what the new version of BRI is going to be like. Yeah, I, I would I would agree with that. I mean, I think it's actually it's sort of Belt and Road 3.0. First one was what you got at the start with the mega infrastructure, and then there was the Belt and Road Conference last year, where it's China started talking about a Belt and Road that was going to be greener, more multilateral. Um, that, that's now gone out of the window because of COVID, um, and so currently it's much harder to build mega infrastructure projects in this kind of environment. So there's been a bit of a go slow, but I think um, you know this remains a priority for the Chinese regime, and in this this second or third iteration that's now going to develop. You might see fewer, um, you know, ten billion dollar port and railway projects, but you'll see more uh, telecoms, fiber, um, digital trade parks. You'll see a lot more health diplomacy in the aftermath of COVID. And the ultimate aim of Belt and Road remains the same as it ever was, which is to create um, an economic sphere um, in, in which you have value chains that. Um, originate from China and, and go to its sort of near abroad. So instead of having an economic system where the ultimate sort of end is North America, Europe or Japan, um, you have a reorientation of particularly Asian production backwards and forwards from China. And I don't think that aim has stopped. It might be um, achieved in a slightly different way or it might move on to a different stage, less about huge infrastructure projects and more about uh, other types of strategies. 
but I, I think the ultimate aim of creating an economic Chinese sphere, particularly with a focus on Central and Southeast Asia, remains exactly the same, and China will push forward with that. I had a question that came in before the webinar, and I promised uh, the individual to, to address it. And it's more on the strategic political outlook within China and US. Uh, and the question goes, I often think that the political strategists in Beijing are better at getting what they want as outcome in the trade war, while Trump outburst appears spontaneous. Do you think that the Chinese political system have developed answers and possible actions way in advance to each midnight Twitter tweet from Donald Trump, um, enabling them to always be one step ahead strategically as within a game of chess? I don't think so. No, uh, I, think, <laughs> I think that, you know, what we have seen from the Wolf Warriors, which is, uh, uh, you know, these to explain them for those people who don't know, are these people who, you know, have also been um, spokespeople of the foreign ministry and they've been ambassadors attacking people who criticize China and they came very strongly uh, out on the stage and have withdrawn again now because it seems that the Chinese government has realized that this has actually been a very had a very negative effect uh, on um, opinion in Europe for example so now they're kind of calling them back and saying, okay, I've, I've actually been to the foreign ministry um, uh, press conference and seen people just read out of their notes, people who've been really, really, uh, you know, outspoken before. So it seems like, uh, no, I also think a lot of the time you can see that the Chinese are reacting really slowly. Uh, as a journalist, it's always very frustrating, actually, that we have to wait for the response from the Chinese. They're always like, uh, if you days behind or maybe even weeks, I think. So we can basically conclude they're less strategic than we like to think when it comes to policy and making actions on, on their... I, I, I think, I think oh, Debbie, Debbie what, what China has done, I would say what China has done, which we don't see as much from the US under this administration, is they have gotten smarter at this. They have realized that, oh, you know, there are options that you would have thought would be off the table in the U.S. that are now on the table. And so I suspect that the Chinese have done a much better job of pulling themselves together and saying, what are options that might be in play, that might not have been in play before, deploying all of the resources that they can muster in certain areas to say, what, what are the options that might arise and then how might we begin to respond? And in particular... I think on the Chinese side, more measured perhaps than they might have to do, but because they're trying to think through some real unique uh, uh, challenges that they're facing. Uh, compared to the US side, where again, I would say, especially under Trump and especially as we've gotten deeper into his administration, policy is made without regard to any knowledge of China, much knowledge of Asia. I mean, it is just really made in a vacuum. And so anything really could happen. And in that situation, if you are the other side, you have to respond. It's, it is tricky and challenging. So it's, it's not a surprise to me that you're occasionally caught off guard by what the US administration is doing, because you would not have imagined it if you hadn't been up at 3 a.m. looking at, you know, the tweets that are coming across and all of a sudden a new policy is in place. So I think it's been hard for, you know, I mean, to have some a tiny amount of sympathy here for the Chinese or anyone trying to deal with this administration. Their uh, seat of the pants policymaking is hard to manage. Yeah. And I mean, but you can, see that, you, you can see that uh, there's a lot of tit for tat going on. Uh, in China that if the US actually closes an embassy, then China will close an embassy. If they expel um, politicians or like um, diplomats, China will do the same. And they've said that we will actually, you know, do a payback for everything that you do against China. So we see that they've actually followed through on that. But that doesn't necessarily mean that they've thought about, about it in advance. James, first one. Oh, I, I was just going to make a, it's a very simple point. If you think about who China has traditionally spoken to in the US, then it's either been a, a kind of long-term um, administration officials or it's been senior business, Wall Street. 
Wall Street and corporate America. And Wall Street and corporate America are precisely the sort of people Donald Trump doesn't listen to. So the interface that you had between, you know, for instance, the US-China strategic economic dialogue, the people that China were used to talking to, they weren't the people who had any influence over what Trump was doing. So I completely agree with Debbie. I don't think it's that the Chinese are brilliant at playing three-dimensional chess and are thinking a hundred moves ahead. I think they're just as confused about Trump as everybody else is. They don't know how to read him and they sort of tried their best to kind of come to a reasonable accommodation because um, seen from the Chinese point of view, actually, they don't particularly want this trade war. It, it, it's damaging um, economically. It threatens the internal stability of the party, which is the ultimate consideration. And so, you know, most of what you read in the trade war has been China mostly being kind of conciliatory to some degree and, and Trump sort of throwing his toys out of the pram. So, it, and that's hard to deal with if you're trying to work out how to calm things down a bit, which, I mean, you have a question here about China's behavior in other domains where China perhaps hasn't been trying to calm things down a bit. But on the trade war, I think generally China has been trying to, to, to tamp this down over, over recent years. So we have several questions coming in from the audience and I want to address uh, them. And there's one in particular. Why has China chosen such a provocative stance on a number of issues, such as the Uyghur camps, South China Sea Islands, Hong Kong, to denounce responsibility for COVID, etc., when they traditionally would have been more subtle and calm and using the 100-year perspective that was mentioned? So a, a yeah. big question there. Yeah, I think actually when it comes to some of these issues, we have to look at, uh, you know, the most important thing for the Chinese government is the Chinese audience, not the foreign countries. And um, uh, for Xi Jinping, it's an extremely, extremely important project to build this nation into a strong nation. And uh, if you look at what happened in Norway with the lapse, you know, we also had campaigns where we actually, you know, tried to integrate these people in ways that uh, the majority of Norwegians thought was good for them. So in, in this aspect, I think the Chinese are kind of uh, a bit behind on this way of thinking, uh, but it's relevant to look at it in this perspective. We see now minorities in China, the uh, Uyghurs in Xinjiang or the Muslims, and you have uh, Inner Mongolia, you have Tibet, you have other regions where the Chinese are now pushing Chinese you know, Mandarin language more than the, um, uh, their own local languages in a project to say that we're helping them you know, become a part, bigger part of the, the family so that they can have success in the future. So it's more like, yeah, from our perspective, maybe we think of these uh, regions as autonomous, could be moving more into an independent country at some stage. Like we've looked at Hong Kong, hoping, many people have been hoping that Hong Kong can bring democracy to China. And it's been difficult to imagine that, you know, it would go the other way, but that's exactly the way it's going. China is building its country by, you know, strengthening more the equality. So that's why they have this very sometimes brutal um, way of actually pushing in, pushing this policy. And, uh, you know, we know in China that if you're actually opposed to it, it will be like 10 people demonstrating the next day, you know, they'll be off the street. They're very, very efficient in stopping any kind of uprisal. So, yeah, that's, that's how China is building its country, basically. And I, 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 let me just add something to that. I think it gets back to this question of three-dimensional chess, that we, we somehow assume that Xi Jinping and the standing committees sit around and, and decide, now we are going to push forward our advantage and stroke the cat that is sitting on their knee. It doesn't really work like that. So in each of these cases, there's been a mixture of kind of deliberate um, action and accident. So in India, I tend to think that this was happened locally, um, that the initial, um, the initial uh, kind of military... Uh, uh, conflagration came from local factors and then both sides have decided that they can't back down. In Hong Kong, it seems reasonably clear to me that actually China didn't really want to act this quickly and maybe in the medium term it did, but it sort of felt that it eventually had to act because it was worried that what was happening in Hong Kong was going to affect 
was going to spill over into China, but that actually, if it looks back on it, it's probably very happy with the outcome that it's got, um, given that, that, you know, for relatively little cost, it's managed to sort of push forward. Actually, in the South China Sea, there's a lot of talk in the West about China being much, much more aggressive in the South China Sea. But as far as I can see, that's not particularly true. They, they haven't done anything terribly dramatic um, that the kind of security analysts are, are looking for. So I think in the West, I, it's understandable because this is what happened after the 2008 crisis, where you really did see suddenly a, a kind of China pushing forward on all fronts. Um, on this occasion, that may be the, the sort of net effect, but, but actually each of these, there are some local factors at play and some of them are more accidental than they are the result of a kind of deliberate grand strategy. Sure. Uh, I have one question that came in and is linked to what you just said, uh, James. Uh, China's power play in South uh, China Sea is a complex, serious issue for the countries that's directly affected. Vietnam, Philippines, Japan, India, Indonesia, and Taiwan. If we should predict how the situation will unfold, will we have to redraw sea and maybe even country maps in a few years from today? You, you toned down the, uh, the issue a bit, James, said that nothing dramatic has really happened. But if you look in the Philippines, it is relatively dramatic for the people in, in the country in terms of getting very close to the border of the country. Yeah, I mean, you can see examples in the Philippines, in Vietnam, in Indonesia, where there have been particular tensions um, bubbling along. And, and the, from the Chinese side, you also see claims that, in a sense, the United States and its allies is increasingly militarizing the region, you know, doing more freedom of navigation operations. You see, for instance, the Australians um, beginning to spend more money on defense and beginning to kind of take an interest. Even India uh, tried to tweak China um, by, by sending some ships into this sort of region. I don't think you're going to see the fundamental redrawing of maps, but, you know, it's pretty clear what China's objective is. The question is really how far will China risk pushing this to the next stage, which would, for instance, to be to do something at Scarborough Shoal, which is one of the parts of the South China Sea people watch, or to uh, try and enforce an air exclusion zone. So there are various things that would amount to a serious escalation. But I, I think it may be the case that China has most of what it wants and will just kind of continue to push forward gradually. And that actually the, the real action is no longer taking place in the South China Sea. The real action is taking place in the cyber and technological domains where, where in a sense there's much more room for maneuver for, for China to, to, to kind of expand its influence in different ways. Okay, I hope with, uh, I, I I think... the yeah? Okay, Manu first and then uh, Shasti. Yeah, sorry, um, <clears throat> I, I, I think um, <clears throat> this uh, issue of the South China Sea goes beyond just the Isles and the Nine Dash Line. The essential and critical point is that it is intolerable for China to be so exposed and um, it has this long coast and it is highly exposed to threats from the sea. And the US has a very strong position in the Western Pacific and that the Chinese sea as a fundamental threat to it. And it is, I think, one of the most important priorities of Chinese security policy that over time, they have to push America out of the Western Pacific and work out some kind of new deal with the US where the U.S. is not in the Western Pacific. That is really important. The, the South China Sea issue is a subset of that. It is a step towards achieving the kind of security on the coastal area that China seeks. By dominating those isles and by building those military facilities, China advances its military position vis-a-vis -vis the U.S. and advances its strategy of eventually pushing the U.S. out of the Western Pacific. That is what the game is about. And this is going to take a long time to resolve. We talked a lot about uh, China, obviously, in this uh, webinar, and that's natural. But can India be a counterweight to uh, US within Asia setting? Do, uh, do, do you want me to take that? I, I, I yes, yes, that. please. Yep. Yes, in the, in, the, in the long term, India definitely will be. And in a sense, that's been the aim of many countries in Southeast Asia that, as Manu said, you know, if you're Singapore, really your strategic objective, your ultimate strategic objective is not to have the Americans leave. 
because you want a situation in which there's a certain balance in the region. And, and so you're happy with that. But, but a subsidiary strategic objective is a stronger India, because, you know, if you have a stronger India, then that allows you to, to kind of balance between China and India. So the idea of a stronger India, economically stronger, militarily stronger, is broadly, I think, welcome in most parts of Southeast Asia. Um, the frustration has always been that it's not happening as quickly as it might be. And I think the unfortunate reality is that, it, that this process of it's not happening as quickly as one might like is going to be extended because of COVID. Uh, I mean, India, as with all of South Asia, is struggling um, greatly with the pandemic. Public finances will be in really poor shape. That will make it much more difficult for India to project power abroad. So although India under Modi, uh, whatever you might think of him, has become a much more regionally active power, both you know, bilaterally and multilaterally, relationship with Japan, relationship with Vietnam, Australia, the Quad, um, you know, the United States in particular, I mean, in the end, India needs a strong economy to be able to underpin its ambitions to be um, what they call a leading power and then eventually a great power. And at the moment, given its economy is in a pretty poor shape, then I think um, you know, that, that process is going to be much slower than both India would like, but also many of its, its friends in this part of the world as well. We had a few questions coming in and they all touch upon ASEAN for, for one reason or another. And I'll pick one of them, which maybe encapsulates there are a few questions. Beyond the region, ASEAN is often described as a loud sounding nothing. What role can or should ASEAN play in the region between China and US? Wanna? Yeah, let me try that. I think, uh, <clears throat> first of all, <clears throat> structurally and organizationally, ASEAN is not strong. It, if anything, it has weakened in the last uh, decade. It is more divided. I think the gravitational pull of China is so strong in the northern part of ASEAN that the continental part of ASEAN has moved away from the other parts of ASEAN and the interests of these two geographic parts of ASEAN have diverged. So we have different interests now and that makes getting a consensus in ASEAN much more difficult. We are less coherent, less united, and that is, you know, makes it very difficult. Uh, but on the other hand, <clears throat> ASEAN is seen as an honest broker we have these organizational formats, the ASEAN Regional Forum, the ASEAN Defense Ministers Meeting Plus Plus, where all the big powers come and they find it very convenient to use ASEAN as a, some kind of platform where they meet and they negotiate and uh, they, they, they have exchanges. So we have a role to play in providing that platform for the big powers to come and talk to each other. Thank you. Okay, we are soon approaching uh, 60 minutes and we've been able to cover quite a few topics and angles to a complex issue. But if I could ask you at the end to give a one minute uh, advice to senior leaders in Singapore and Europe wanting to position themselves in Asia for the long run, what would be your, your key, key advice? If I can start with Manu, then James and Deborah and Justy, if you can give you your, your pitch on that. I think my one minute interjection would be to not forget ASEAN. Uh, it's very easy to underestimate ASEAN because it is divided. And uh, if you look at the individual countries, they each have some problem or other politically, business system or whatever. But if, take a step back and look at it. Infrastructure spending has been uh, greatly accelerated. The business ecosystem is improving as the World Bank's uh, ease of doing business uh, report will show. And some important reforms are coming through like the labor market reform in Indonesia, which will pass, I think, by September. And that really uh, makes this region much more investable. And I, I suspect, barring any big political problem, we're going to see a significant acceleration of economic growth in ASEAN. So I would say, think about India, think about China and all that, but don't forget ASEAN. Thank you. James? And I think it's, this remains a time of enormous commercial opportunity. I mean, what, what, what you see at the moment is we've had a couple of decades in which the rules of the economic and technological system have pulled in the same direction, namely in the, the period of high globalization where technology was bringing the world together and politics was also bringing the world together. Now you have a divergence of those two forces. So technology is still to some degree pushing the world together as you know, we can see now with our, our Zoom call bringing us all together, companies are operating the way that the 5G sort of IoT revolution will create huge new opportunities. And most of that growth is still gonna come through Asia as most of the world's people will become the world's most important economic center, it probably already is. 
but the problem is the politics are diverging. And so I think it's a case of, you know, don't take your eye off the ball in Asia, continue to invest here, but, but be much more careful than you were uh, um, in the previous couple of decades about how you read the, the political tea leaves about what's happening in the region and, and sort of pick your, your markets more carefully based upon that. Thank you, James. Deborah? Well, I think disruption is unfortunately for businesses here to stay for at least the time that you're likely to be in your post. So prepare for that. And in particular, figure out ways to, to turn uh, to your competitive advantage. So es especially for firms that are in Asia, think about Asia as a final market in and of itself. So we haven't had a whole lot of development of in Asia for Asia. We've been for so long powered by market growth in the US or Europe or elsewhere. I think if you think about in Asia for Asia and you harness all of the competitive tools you might find, including you might imagine for someone who does trade, trade agreements, uh, you, you can actually find opportunities in a time of extended and extensive disruption. Thank you. Shosti, how do you see it from mainland China today? Yeah, I think I would like to end where I started to say that history is extremely important if you want to understand what uh, China's uh, hopes for the future in this region uh, would be. You should look at, uh, you know, centuries ago. It's uh, not like China wants to rule other countries or dominate them any more than that, that they will expect allegiance politically uh, and you will have economical exchange um, uh, as a favor from China in that perspective. They will give you, um, you know, um, what should I say, profits if your allegiance is with China. Thank you. And with that, I must say we've been very disciplined. We're exactly uh, within one hour. And uh, let me, before we log off, draw your attention to Singapore Norway Innovation Conference, which takes place on the 29th of September. And we have a good lineup of speakers and from Singapore, Enterprise Singapore CEO and Innovation Norway in, Nor in Norway. So that's the two counterparts. So please log can in I, to can I just, us. Yeah. Can I just say something that, you know, my last words is not my recommendation. It's just that, right, that you should, uh, uh, you know, uh, deal with China, China like that in the future. But I think it's important to look at the historical perspective to understand the dynamics. That's, that was my point. Thank you, Shasti, for clarifying. So for registering on SNCC, go to nbas.org.sg and uh, please participate. It's going to be an awesome setting. And I thank all of you, Manu, James, Deborah, Shasti, for very enlightening uh, discussion. And we will, uh, we will uh, turn off from there. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.